style. It just gave us more time. Take Our it. quarantine. Do you really it. have a mask on your machine? No. <laughs> I, think, I, I think that's your next project. Okay. <laughs> I, I love it. The colors is just wonderful. Let's just get out there. So just remember, there is adventure around every band. You just got to get out there and create your own adventure. At, At your, your leisure. leisure. For your home heating and cooling repairs, you deserve a service that shows up on time, professionally and respectfully. That integrity has kept Triple T in business for almost 50 years. Triple T is passionate about improving people's lives, expert inspections, and needed repairs. No more, no less. Right now, save up to $625 on a new Bryan Home Comfort System or save $200 on a ductless air conditioner. Triple T Plumbing, Heating, and Cooling. And Bryant, whatever it takes to keep your family comfortable.
All right, well, let's get started. We'd like to welcome everyone to our uh, city council meeting tonight. Once again, we're down here at the High Chaparral. Is that right? Good. And so, uh, so we can uh, practice good social distancing, and then uh, we'll see what happens next time. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I've asked uh, Councilman Gordon to give us an opening prayer. Father in heaven, we're thankful this evening for the opportunity that we have to be together. We're grateful for the opportunity that we have to uh, make decisions that affect this great community. We're grateful for the women and men that live here and, and, and ask a blessing upon each and every one of them. We pray that uh, during this meeting we might be able to discuss uh, those agenda items that uh, are happening at this moment and, and pray that we will make... Uh, wise decisions as we do so. We ask a blessing upon those women and men that help keep us safe. First responders, please please pr protect and watch over them and that they might uh, go home to their families safe and sound. We ask a blessing upon uh, all of our, again, elderly that uh, might be a little more susceptible to the COVID-19. We pray that uh, we might be able to uh, be free of of this uh, virus very soon we pray this and for any other favors thou sees fit in the name of Jesus Christ amen, amen. thank you I've asked council member back to lead us in the pledge of allegiance please stand and repeat the pledge I, I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of, of the United States of America, of America and, and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> okay, let's uh, move on to public comments. Anyone here from the public would like to address the mayor of the council? You're welcome to come up and talk to us. Just state your name and... My name is uh, Nathan Mussel and uh, Mayor Lafson and uh, City Council men and women, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I appreciate it. Um, if it's okay, I'm just going to read a statement. I'm uh, a little emotional about the topic, and I don't want to um, seem more frustrated than I am. One week ago, the murder of George Floyd caused outrage among the African American community and has highlighted racial biases in our community justice system, criminal justice system. Racism is the easiest thing to be against and the easiest thing to speak out against. Speaking out against racism is not speaking out against police. In Spanish work, we have an outstanding police force. I've waited a week for somebody in leadership, anybody in leadership, to publicly say that racism will not be tolerated in our city, or even something more simple like how tragic the circumstances leading up to Mr. Floyd's death were. I've watched public information systems, and all I have been able to find is silence from four of you, a request not to blame from politicians from one of you, and, uh, and something about this is why every American needs an AR-15 and a 30-round clip from one of you. I don't know what to say except that you have failed our city in this matter and told every black resident that we have that their lives, in fact, do not matter in Spanish Fork. And I hope you will rectify this immediately. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? <clears throat> I've known Nathan since he was yay high. He was back in... Uh, back on what west side of town when I lived there. Do you remember me back then? Yeah, All right, he remembers. <laughs> Nathan's a good guy. Uh, and, and I've been in a few conversations uh, over this past uh, couple, three weeks with people uh, both in person as well as uh, uh, through emails. And, and honestly can say that uh, we have uh, some good leadership, uh, including here. Uh, and is not only in our local government, but uh, state government that has reached out to me and, and sent texts regarding uh, the goings on in our uh, n n neighboring communities and as far as up in Salt Lake and then in Minnesota. But nevertheless, uh, the uh, 
civil unrest regarding the, the death of uh, George Floyd uh, is very disturbing to, to all of us. Uh, and I've had conversations uh, with each of you uh, through text and, and otherwise to, that, uh, that also express that. And, you know, I totally support the, the, the police chief there uh, firing those four individuals uh, and wait for the, the outcome of the, of the court system and the justice system to determine what should be done uh, to, to them in the future. One of the comments that I've been able to, uh, to share with others is that feeling, as well as the feeling about, like Nathan has mentioned, the character of our, our officers here. Uh, I know by knowing them and knowing their character that uh, th that their character would disallow them to uh, put someone in, in such a situation as uh, Mr. Floyd was found, let alone three others standing by and allowing that to be done. Um, I'm confident that they, just because of their, their characters, that, that that would not happen. Likewise, uh, I'm confident of that because of their training and expertise and education that they, they receive each and every year. N we're not perfect, of course. We, we have uh, times that we need to uh, do better, uh, but uh, certainly I, I'm, I'm very confident that uh, uh, our officers would act appropriately in, in, in a similar situation, uh, and I'm, I'm very happy and, and proud and glad that it, in personal conversations I've had to the support of our, our council and mayor and you know even those that uh, are up at the Capitol. So just wanted to share that. Thank you. Can I ask a quick question, Nathan? Did you email us or how did you reach out? Sorry, yeah. Yep. Just because this is the first time I'm hearing. Uh, I, I did not reach out to the council as a whole. I okay. just uh, sat back and watched and waited and hoped, hoped oh, to okay. see something from somebody. Okay, thank you. Okay, anyone else from the public like to address us? Seeing none, I would uh, go to council comments. Uh, Councilman Argyle. I don't have anything at this time, Mayor. Councilman Gordon. Mayor. Uh, had a garbage meeting uh, last week, and uh, new transfer station uh, is coming along. I think Scott's going to load some some pictures and some drawings of that. Our uh, our annual budget was approved, and uh, uh, with really the only main discussion item of recycling uh, going up, fifteen dollars a ton. And uh, I think, uh, as everyone is aware, through the discussions of Recycling, it's, it's, uh, it's still very difficult to get um, recycling done as, as there's not really a good uh, MER for manufacturing recycle facility here in, in, uh, in our area. Um, we were able to sell some of the surplus property out front of this, uh, our new uh, transfer station site. Uh, go ahead and click through. These are just some of the renderings of the, the new, this one's and this is not as exciting as potentially um, the aerial or the something like this. And so um, the road at the, to the left of the screen is, is neighboring Utah County's property. <coughs> We've acquired all of uh, the easements that we need to with them. And uh, you see the wetlands there to the right of the screen that they were able to squeeze every inch of area they could into the new transfer station. This will be uh, very important as we move forward because of uh, keeping the public uh, separate from the commercial haulers. And uh, we've learned some major lessons as of late, especially with the COVID-19 uh, every morning, especially after weekends. It's, it's just, they're just lined out in Springville all the way out and down the road. And, and at moments, our commercial haulers are not able to get in for a half hour or more and uh, stops them from doing their job. So, so this is much needed. Uh, again, we're, st we're breaking records uh, at the transfer station with the amount of the tonnage that we're taking in. And so I uh, just wanted to show off uh, the rendering that they've got where our next step is to, uh, is to put out an RFQ and, and select a uh, CMGC as uh, 
we'll get the plans to 30% and then start building. And uh, I don't have a specific time frame. I think best case would be uh, sometime in the early part of 22 is, is really kind of what I'm thinking, looking at Chris and kind of just seeing. It'll, we'll know more as we get our CMGC on board. So, um, and then I just wanted to tell Seth how I appreciated him sitting down and uh, as we go into public hearing and, and discuss further our annual budget, uh, Seth is always good to meet with, with all of us and, and go over any discussions and talks as, as our budget's now over a hundred million annually. It's, it's pretty it's pretty impressive how much there is to talk about and, and oftentimes people don't see all of the work that goes on behind the scenes and so I appreciate Seth taking time out of his schedule and any other staff as we have questions uh, about the budget. So, uh, Fire Station continues to move forward and uh, if you have a chance to drive up uh, on east, uh, east end of town on Canyon Road and see the progress um, and as, as they are continuing uh, that construction looks good and uh, then the only other thing I wanted to report was uh, I was able to sit in a planning meeting, a TDR meeting as we discussed, continue to discuss uh, the uh, TDR options for the river bottoms. appreciate all of the Dave Anderson and his group's uh, efforts in, in making sure that uh, we make the right decisions to potentially preserve or do preserve that, that beautiful part of our community. So that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Councilman Mendenhall. Thank you, Mayor. I'll try to not uh, reverb like Brandon. Get that fixed, will you? Yeah, sorry. That's off now. Um, my list of stuff uh, from the last week, it, it seems like, you know, we get into summer and we think we're going to maybe have some some uh, time with our assignments that we have and then and then it's just one thing on on another but uh, starting off with the Chamber of Commerce uh, we've uh, met a couple of times since our last council meeting uh, as the Chamber uh, the latest uh, uh, public releases of the Chamber was that uh, we're celebrating J Mart as our April business of the month great Main Street business that's been there for a long, long time, and another Main Street business, MVP Sports on Main Street as uh, May's Business of the Month. So April and May's uh, Business of the Months will be celebrated this week. Uh, there is an email out there from, from Heather to the Chamber membership of uh, how the public and how the business community can come help celebrate a, a couple of uh, great Main Street businesses for uh, April and May. Thanks to all the businesses for doing what you've done during these unique times and circumstances and reinventing yourself. Uh, appreciated Dave's department uh, from the city in, in trying to be a, a point of contact there and uh, as well as, uh, you know, as, as well as a resource uh, in, in all the, the, the new things with the CARES Act and, and different items there. So um, multiple businesses have, have replied to me saying they appreciate Dave's office during this, this time of reinventing. Uh, Spanish Fork Rec Department, boy, it was uh, great to be down at the ballpark Saturday morning uh, practicing the Red Sox. Um, it's probably the wrong color and wrong logo, right? But <laughs> Brandon's okay with it. But uh, the Red Sox uh, in the Pony League uh, division, Mayor, we're going to be tough. I'm just telling you, we're going to be tough. Well, just so you know, uh, there was a guy that coached the Pony League Red Sox. Years ago, I'm not going to let the kids know that. Okay. that I have yeah, to there's a high standard. Oh Sorry, boy. Okay, all right. Okay. Well, we got some pitchers, we got some hitters, and uh, and it's going to be fun to watch them. It uh, it just felt really good to uh, to walk into the ballpark and see kids uh, practicing, uh, and, uh, and and coaches uh, uh, throwing to kids and, and having a good time. So I look forward to tomorrow and and, uh, and Thursday. Uh, with the Red Sox games, and, and I know everybody else does down there too. So thanks, Dale, to your department, getting that uh, put together in such a quick way, uh, and uh, and letting us have a, a baseball season, and a softball season, and a soccer season, and everything else that that uh, that people appreciate uh, about our rec department. So 
I look forward to it. The Utah League of Cities and Towns, uh, we've had multiple meetings virtually as well, uh, discussing uh, you know, the, the COVID-19 situation, uh, what that looks like, uh, and, uh, and the changes there, but also um, uh, since the, uh, the protests uh, happening in Salt Lake City, uh, been in constant contact with the executive board of the league, uh, including uh, Mayor Aaron Mendenhall of, of Salt Lake City, uh, the governor's office, and, uh, and everyone else. So uh, appreciate the, the chief's uh, sentiments there. Appreciate uh, Mr. Muscle's uh, sentiments there as well. Uh, the, the constant contact uh, that's, that's happened between uh, local elected officials and the police uh, chiefs all across the Wasatch Front, not, not only that, but, but down in, in Washington County as well, uh, has, uh, has been something that, uh, that didn't, you know, didn't necessarily plan on, but, but it happened. Uh, and um, uh, maybe if I could just read, uh, I know all of you as elected officials, but uh, all elected officials in the state received an email from the League of Cities and Towns uh, on Saturday, um, just updating us of, of, uh, of how to be you know, ready in coordination with, with our public safety officials and, and with our city as that, as that you know, situation was dynamic and, and changing. I'll just read shortly my, my two cents of that email that uh, that said, each of our respective cities are unique and we are confident that as leaders, you'll have the most accurate information and make the best decision for you. This caution and preparation recognizes that what is happening in Salt Lake City could potentially move into other communities. Again, that was in coordination with the governor's office, with uh, Mayor Mendenhall's office of Salt Lake City, uh, Mayor Caldwell of Ogden, Mayor Pike of St. George, Mayor Ramsey of South Jordan. Obviously those, all of our communities are different in one aspect or the other, just like our state is different. Um, but I will tell you this, watching uh, over the last week that situation in telling my wife and my kids that, um, you know, while I couldn't pretend to know uh, someone's situation or, or how it is to, 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 to live as a, a black man in the United States of America, I, you know, I, I have stood at, at that intersection of, of Lake Street in Minnehaha Avenue too. And I've, I've talked to many people in Minnesota for a couple of years, uh, Minneapolis specifically, while I was talking, uh, talking to them about, uh, you know, about my specific religion. Uh, and so the love I have for, for those people specifically, but for that area is something that was, uh, was intimate to me and my family. And um, the discussion uh, that, that Chief said so well of, of um, you know, how we rise to an occasion is something that, uh, that I'm proud of, um, of our local law enforcement. Uh, I'm proud of, of the coordination between cities to simply uh, try to do the best we can. Um, I, I, I did make a, a, a social media post in an effort that I feel like some people take an instance uh, that, that maybe uh, in the season of politics that we're in uh, to simply try to say, hey, this is how I'd be different. This is what I'd do different. This is the cause of you know, politics in a certain area. And, and uh, I know those people intimately. I know, I know I've got to know over the last couple of years some of those elected officials, and I know that they, they do work hard in their community to simply be with their people and in times like this even mourn with them when they mourn and, and, and try to understand them. And so I appreciate that dynamic of it. I appreciate us being different than, than everywhere else uh, in our own unique way, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean that we tolerate any uh, level of of, uh, of racism, certainly any any level of uh, mistreatment of somebody just because they're of a different color. Um, so th this moment obviously uh, has us as elected officials not above reproach whatsoever, but working together to rise to an occasion and uh, and increase the level of discourse to a, a, a place that uh, gets us better tomorrow 
than, than maybe we are today. So uh, again, I appreciate the league. I appreciate our, our leadership uh, here in the city coordinating with, with the mayor and all of you and, uh, and Chief and, and Seth and, uh, and, and, and being ready for whatever we can to, to obviously protect uh, our citizens in this dynamic and changing situation. Uh, that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Scobes. Uh, Mayor, just want to report on uh, Utah Lake Commission. Um, uh, had that as a, it was a virtual meeting. Uh, went over again algae blooms, uh, something that the Water Quality Utah Lake uh, Commission talks about ad nauseum, uh, continually looking at the safety of everyone, um, everyone that uses and borders the, borders the lake. Um, and then the only thing, only thing of note other than just, just regular business uh, that they do uh, was talking about uh, virtual tours and virtual um, each year you have uh, third and fourth graders that go down to Utah Lake and take tours and, and look at the water cycle and things that way. Uh, they had virtual tours that actually were, if you look at numbers, they reported that far more people used the virtual tours, uh, the teachers and students, than actually travel to go see it. And so this is something that uh, in this COVID era has kind of lent to uh, a new way of doing things. Uh, they will probably still have uh, the on-site tours, but these, uh, these virtual tours seem to be much more useful and beneficial to the teachers and the students, and that was something that was, that was unexpected uh, that they will continue to do. Uh, also, a thanks, uh, the Veterans Council, uh, the American Legion, uh, uh, the BFW, uh, all the veterans, uh, appreciate all those that uh, participated, uh, helped put out the crosses for the Memorial Day um, remembrance. I'm not going to use the word celebration. Um, the, it just was very different from what we've had in years past, but uh, certainly a uh, day of remembrance for those that have, that have paid the ultimate sacrifice for our freedoms uh, and just appreciate the, all the citizens that volunteered and, and, and took that time uh, to do. Um, lastly, I do, I do want to uh, address Mr. Musel's um, comments uh, because there are those out there that say that as a council we don't listen when people say things and, and bring them to our attention. Um, quite frankly, and this is, this is my own personal feeling, uh, it is not of the council. It is my personal feeling as a, as, as a citizen and as an individual. Um, uh, and this is meant merely to illustrate, not diminish, uh, the life that was taken in Minneapolis. Um, water is wet. Fire is hot, and I don't go around talking about those continually anytime I see the rain or I see a forest fire. Racism is bad. I don't see the need in a community where I have not once seen an ounce of racism take place. I don't see the need to mention it and bring it up in this community and in this setting. Uh, now, my own social media posts, I might say something that supports the Second Amendment. I might make a post about how things are good or bad. Um, in my own community, I find exceptional and have never seen any ounce of racism. Um, and so it's not something that I find lacking in myself or in my peers serving our community because we didn't mention it, because it's not something that comes to the forefront of our minds because we don't see it, fortunately, in our community. Uh, there are other things, sex trafficking, teen obesity, abortion, the hashtag MeToo movement. These are things that none of us have made comments on as well. Some things, unfortunately, might be happening in our community, and others, I'm sure, probably are not. But generally speaking, as for myself, I don't make comments in this forum on national scale events. Uh, generally, I am worried about Spanish Fork citizens and Spanish Fork growth and Spanish Fork safety. Proudly, we have great safety and we have wonderful citizens. And so I don't think to make a comment about racism because it's never on my mind. I don't see race. I don't act in race. I've worked for 25 years with soldiers of different colors, just as I know you have. And so I don't ever think of someone as race. Quite frankly, I saw an innocent man killed by a bad cop, or at least 
what seems to be a bad cop. Maybe he had a good record. I haven't followed it as much because we have fiesta days and other things that I've been much more worried about. But I have never mentioned it because I don't ever think of it. And I'm grateful that I live in a community where racism has not reared its ugly head, at least not in my presence. Um, but to your point, racism is bad and I'm glad that we don't see it on a high level in our community. Uh, and for those in our community that say that the council does not listen, we do, but simply because we don't do what you say or someone else says doesn't mean we don't listen because we have 40,000 people to care for and to take care of. Uh, and we do the very best job that we can at that. Um, but I do thank you for, for your concern and your comment in bringing that up. Um, but know that by my view and the time I've spent on the council, um, it's not any short-sightedness by any member of our elected officials. It's the fact that it's not anything that we confront and not anything in our dealings with 40,000 people that we've ever seen. And so the thought to mention it, it's a far gone conclusion. Water is wet, racism is bad, fire is hot. It's something that is an understood, at least with this body, that I don't think we ever needed to make mention. Um, but I will go on record for the mayor and council, if I may, that yes, racism is bad and we abhor it in all, in all faces um, that it may show. Mayor, that's all I have. Thank you. Council member Beck. Thank you. I want to first start off that um, Miss Vanish Fork will be streamed live next Tuesday night, June 9th at 7 p.m. And Morgan Reed will pass the crown or the torch on to the next deserving young lady. So that's all I have with that. And then I also wanted to address Nathan. Um, I've just been kind of writing, writing my thoughts down. And I, not that I would disagree with Kier, but I, I'm sure racism is all over our community. As I've been reading other people's posts and the news, I'm learning a lot. Therefore, I have no right to make any sort of post because I'm in that learning mode. I'm like thinking things through. When I'm hearing white privilege, I'm like, I'm not white privileged. Then I read more about it. And I'm thinking, I'm absolutely white privileged. Um, all of us are white privileged when you d dive down into it and see what that really means. And so I'm learning. I'm growing and I'm in no spot to educate anyone else where to get any more information. I think we all need to definitely work on that. My hope through all of this is that our country, our state, and our homes will change. It's time. Um, we need to make those changes and maybe with the social media and, and media in general that it's time that some big changes can happen. And so Nathan, thanks for coming in. That's big. I don't have a lot more to say about it because like I said, I'm just, I'm, I'm not sitting back doing nothing, but it kind of feels like nothing, but I'm hopefully educating myself and realizing where I need to make changes because I don't feel like I'm racist, but when you look at some things, white people do have a different life than anyone of, you know, other races, but that's where I stand, so thank you. That's all. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I just want to uh, wish my mother happy birthday today. She is 94, if you can believe that. So, uh, so it's awesome. I just wanted to make sure I let her know that. A um, couple of things. Your point? Yeah. Do you want to run this, Chief? <laughs> you know, come on up. That's who I started with. <laughs> uh, f first of all, uh, I'm surprised Stacy didn't mention this. In her uh, best in Utah Valley, uh, our uh, Spanish Fork Rodeo was voted the best in Utah Valley in the Utah Valley Magazine. Uh, Fiesta Days was voted the best in the Valley, in Utah Valley. And our golf course was voted second best in Utah Valley, so. Uh, I wanted you to do it. Oh, I figured you did. <laughs> so I was, I'm pleased with that, very pleased with that. And uh, so I think that's uh, uh, a testament to this community, to everyone out there, that uh, we strive to make this city the best we can. And we've got great citizens, we've got great employees and great uh, 
leaders here that help us to uh, achieve those things that benefit our citizens here. Um, just uh, give you an update. We've been, I've been working very hard with uh, the county commissioners and the South County mayors. Uh, as you know, we, this CARES Act money has been allocated to the state. And uh, so I have been on uh, numerous Zoom calls and home conferences and all that with everyone for the last few weeks. And uh, it looks like we're probably getting very close to figure out all that. I've got a meeting Thursday night with all the mayors and the county commissioners, and hopefully we'll be able to iron this all out and uh, be able to get money out to those people that need it, and uh, especially our city. And uh, I just want to reiterate what's been said. Um, no one uh, would ever, you know, condone racism, you know, and we don't want to do that, and we don't do that here. And uh, like I said, it's been said before, just because we haven't spoke out on it, because it's not something that we find here, at least I don't. Uh, there might be cases, but uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we need to work on. Um, there's a lot of things that happen in the world. There's a lot of murders out there. Uh, one particular case, 85-year-old couple that's at the cemetery, and a guy walked up and shot them both. I didn't see a lot of outrage over that, you know. And I don't care if they're white, black, or whatever. That should never happen in this world. That's not right. And what happened in here is not right. And when something like that happens, that doesn't give everyone a free ticket to go out there and destroy property. That's wrong. And I can strongly uh, say that just because there's been one wrong deal. We had a bad cop murder someone. That doesn't give the rest of the state and the world to go out there and destroy property. That's not how our civilization works. You know, it's a bad thing. What we need to do is work here to make a difference. Make a change, you know, and do that peacefully. Martin Luther King did a lot of protesting. Not one building was burnt. Not one store was looted. You know, he did it right. And we can learn a lot from him. That we all are here together. And we can all work together. And we can do it peacefully. And we can do it together the right way. And that's what I hope we can, is everyone get involved in doing that. By graffitiing buildings, by burning buildings, by turning police cars upside down, that is not the way to do it. The way to do it is to show a little love to each other and reach out and let's all work together and make that happen. All right, with that being said, let's move to consent items. Motion to approve the consent items. Got a motion by Councilman Gordon. Second. Second by Councilman Argyle. All in favor say aye. Aye. All right. Public hearing, ordinance 04-20, impact fees enactment. Can someone bring up the impact fee memo? Just make it a little larger. Okay. Uh, we review our impact fees every year. There's a law that states that you need to have an, a project that you collect impact fees for on what's called the impact fee facilities plan. Uh, it's very hard to predict where growth will occur and, and where a lot of the impact fee projects will be done. And so we set up a process where every year we update the impact fee facilities plan and the impact fees get updated along with that. 
Uh, once we get the, the numbers uh, figured out, we meet with the Home Builders Association and we talk it through with them. We actually, this year, where uh, there's a bit of an increase in impact fees, we uh, contracted with some consultants that were experts at impact fees in the state to go through our, all of our processes and make sure that they were uh, highly defensible and, and, and met. Uh, the accepted way of calculating impact fees and both those consultants came back and said they were very well done. Uh, one of the things that is happening across the state is sewer impact fees are going way up and that's because of the regulations on, on sewer treatment plants that requires a lot of treatment plants to just rebuild because they cannot meet those requirements very readily. Uh, that's the case for us, and and uh, with all these sewer requirements, our impact fees are are going up most significantly in the sewer aspect. Uh, the other issue is construction costs have gone up quite a bit, and so you'll notice that our uh, maximum allowable impact fee has uh, really spiked up, and we are not recommending that that we go to the maximum allowable, but in some impact fee funds that are really uh, suffering and taking a hit by projects, <coughs> we are, we're recommending to raise those. And so uh, the main ones would be um, the parks, uh, transportation, and sewer. Uh, pressurized irrigation, as the city grows, our mortgage payment on that pressurized irrigation system is is set, and uh, overall that impact fee went down a little bit. But overall, most most impact fees rose um, altogether. We are uh, proposing an impact fees raise about three thousand dollars per home. That still puts us well below the average impact fee. So if you were to to build in any other city that we compare ourselves to. Uh, those impact fees are are uh, quite a bit higher, and so even with this raise, we'll be lower. But this will help our impact fee funds, which affects our overall budget and cash reserves significantly. If we pass this ordinance, we've gone through it with Home Builders Association. Uh, they've sent us an email. Seth and I read the email today that that. Uh, uh, they really appreciated um, the real transparent way in which we've gone about these impact fees and and uh, didn't have any concerns. And so uh, that's really saying something. Uh, we feel like we have a really good relationship with them and it's, it's because we really r welcome any scrutiny. It's interesting, we had some grandma requests this last year uh, on our impact fee documents from an entity that very obviously was had the opposite concern of most entities on impact fees. They felt like our impact fees were too low and uh, were wanting them to be higher so that their developer clients could get paid back for their impact fee projects uh, sooner. And, uh, and, and really there's some merits to that concern. And, and so with this study, I think this kind of corrects, make some good corrections to our impact fees so that that when an uh, impact fee project is rented by a city or a developer, it gets paid back a little bit sooner. Uh, but again, it is the maximum allowable impact fee, so there's nothing in the law that requires you to collect the maximum, and so uh, uh, those grandma requests didn't ever turn out to, you know, lead to any complaints, but uh, a, a, a request to raise our impact fees, which is kind of ironic. Most cities don't don't get that. But any questions about the impact fees that we're proposing? Okay, thanks. All right. Since this is a public hearing, I would entertain a motion to go into public hearing. So, well, second. Got a motion by Council Member Beck, a second by Councilman Mendenhall. All in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone that would like to address the mayor and council on this issue, you free well, you're welcome to come up. Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to go out of public hearing. So moved. A motion by Councilman Gordon. Second. 
Second by Council Mendenhall. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any uh, comments, discussions? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion. So with the motion, uh, just the comment uh, before my motion is, I know we've probably all had a chance to meet with those different groups and Home Builders Association, Realtors Association that watch this stuff pretty, pretty good. So I appreciate the thoroughness of this, Chris. This is important, I guess, to the public. This is something that we're, when we're um, discussing growth, and that's sometimes a, a tough thing for people that have lived here for a long time and seen this community grow from what were there like three people when you first lived pretty here? Pretty much. Okay. That was pretty much how many were here. <laughs> so thousands up to 44,000 plus here in our community. That's a, 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 a tough thing to sometimes discuss is growth. And this for me represents some level of that new growth helping pay for those new services that need to go out to them. So I appreciate the constant work of your office looking at that. Uh, that's a long way for my motion, Mayor, but uh, I'm, I move to approve Ordinance 4-20, the impact fee enhancement. Second. Got a motion by Council Mendenhall, a second by Council Member Beck. This is a roll call vote. Councilman Scobes. Aye. Council Mendenhall. Aye. Councilman Gordon. Aye. Council Member Beck. Aye. Councilman Argyle. Aye. Okay, that passes. FY 2021 budget. Mayor and Council, um, I'm going to present to you the uh, 2021 budget as a preempt to a public hearing today. Um, there is a, t I'm going to say Scott every time. Scott, I push the space bar, push it again. Um, so what happened so far in the timeline of 2021's budget is on May 5th, you received the tentative budget. It was presented to you and giving you and the public 30 days and an opportunity to review it. Um, today is the public hearing when the public, I got one. No, this is a clicker, city clicker. Oh. Um, at that May 5th when we scheduled this meeting as a public hearing and the tentative budget was posted on the city's website an opportunity for everybody to review. So tonight, uh, we're holding a public hearing to give the public an opportunity to make comment if they'd like to about it. And I'm gonna walk through some of the modifications that uh, have been made um, since the last time. So the, the, the document you have right now, it's a moving document. Uh, since the last time it was presented to you, there's been some tweaks to it. Um, the new one will be posted on the uh, city's website tomorrow. The council has it before them today. Another date to look forward into the future is uh, June 16th. That'll be a day that you either uh, adopt the budget. Um, looks like my slide doesn't fit on that slide. There's one more date on there. Um, we can adopt the budget on June 16th for next year, um, with the exception of if you're gonna have a truth and taxation hearing, then that truth and taxation hearing will need to be, take place in August. And I think that next part of that slide says August 4th on the bottom of that. Um, last year, if you can remember, we talked about holding the rate and raising the rate a little bit for our public safety building, the fire station, and the library. Um, if you're going to do that, that program again, then we'll have to adopt the final budget in August when we have the truth and taxation hearing. I'm going to walk you through a little bit more about that in just a minute. Last year's, or the current budget we're in right now in 2020, uh, it's uh, 117 million. The proposed budget for 2020 is uh, 123 million. Uh, seems pretty big, um, but there are some reasons why capital projects is, are raising that amount. So it's an increase not a decrease, an increase of $6 million from last year. So the new budget um, for this year, starting in July 1st is two th for 2021, is $123 million. 
I'm going to buzz through a couple of sheets that are found inside the, the budget document. I'm not going to go through a, a lot of detail. There's 100 pages here for the public. They can look through all of them if they are, have that interest. The council also has that interest. They can look through and let us know if you have any questions. This is the general fund revenue. Uh, the expenses, I mean, as far as each one of the departments in the general fund. So the general fund has uh, 26 million is the budget for the general fund, uh, which matches uh, our general fund revenue um, for this year. Uh, it's a little small to read on those. Uh, one of the concerns that we had as we were putting the budget together is what's the uh, COVID virus done to our sales tax and anticipating not only the end of this year, but how long does it take us to get our sales tax back up to where it's at? Um, preliminary numbers right now show that we, we were very concerned, but hopefully it's coming out that we're not going to as concerned. Um, it's still going to be lower, but not probably as low as we anticipated it might be. Um, these are the enterprise funds um, for this next year. You can see it's a large 20 million increase in the enterprise funds. Uh, those are largely because of some large projects that are going to be done. And we also have some miscellaneous funds um, that deal with capital projects, the debt service, um, the RAP special revenue fund, and the RDA funds. So for the most part, that's what the budget is, and it's in this 100-page document. If it uh, gives the, the public can comment on it tonight, um, there'll be also future the next couple of weeks uh, until the 16th. There still can be made changes in it. And reality, if we do the tooth and taxation hearing, it can be adopted again in August, on August 4th. And so the finalized could be done in August. We'll run off a tentative budget until then that you've already passed. <clears throat> I briefly want to go through all eight of these for a second. Um, Chris and Seth can possibly jump in on some of these. But the, the budget is dramatically going up in the last couple of years. But there are some substantial projects that are being done. Uh, the first one's the new fire station, or the fire ambulance station, or we want to call Station 62. Is that what we want to call it? Uh, for the, the right name, it's not just the fire station, it's uh, Station uh, 62. has fire and ambulance. Um, that project uh, has been ongoing for the past year. So the expenses are going to be some in th the current year we're in and some in next year. So that's why the budget is a little bit uh, higher for next year also as we're finishing up some of these expenses that have to do with this fire station, ambulance station. Second one is all abilities park. Um, it has a goal to be done in July. It may stretch out a little bit longer than that, and Dale could probably answer to that um, if it needs to be. Um, some COVID ex uh, reasoning is making it extend just a little bit maybe, uh, but it's uh, $13 million as far as th for that park. Um, there's some major roads, uh, some roundabouts that's been in design and in construction between this year and next year. More parks, more trails. Um, there's a, a large purchase from, for the fairgrounds from property, um, which we're glad that the Utah County is going to help on that purchase to help the city out with that purchase. There's also in the works uh, in the next year is the new library and finance office, which will be built in the, where the church stands next to the city office right now. So we're in the process of um, design and bidding out how much that library uh, is going to be. And I'll talk more specifically about this one on how we're going to finance the library in just a few moments. Um, in our work session before this meeting, we talked about the, uh, the, s the improvements at the sewer plant and also in the sewer collection system. Chris could answer some questions about that as far as uh, it's a major, probably the largest expense that the city has ever expended in the history of the city uh, as far as getting a brand new sewer plant. And there is a plan in place for it. It's been in the works for a couple years and it, through the process over the next two or three, four years uh, until it's finally complete, that financing uh, opportunities are, are being planned out. 
So I want to talk a little bit about the new library and the fire ambulance station. Um, two years ago, we started a plan, and it's a three-year plan for each one. Because the fire station started in 2018, their three years are 18, 19, and 20, while the library's three years are 19, 20, and 21. So this is the plan that uh, was presented um, two years ago and one year ago and presenting it again today. And we're gonna walk through a little bit about it for you as the council and also us for the public to understand how this process or the plan is gonna work. Um, like I talked about just a few minutes ago, there is a need for uh, the funding for the library is to raise property tax and the opportunity to have a truth and taxation hearing each year, uh, the plan is, uh, two years ago we had one, a truth and taxation hearing for the fire station. Last year we had a, a, a hearing for the fire station and the library for their first year. This year is the opportunity to have that fire station for the last year and then the uh, library for its second year. Um, that truth and taxation hearing will be set for August 4th. Um, somewhere in the first week, but our first meeting is August 4th, so it's probably going to be August 4th on our first meeting in August. Um, I want to educate the public to see on your property tax bill, on your home, or on your business, there are different taxing entities that tax your home. You can see that on your tax bill, Spanish Fork City's portion of your property tax that we get is only 9% of your property tax bill. You can see the school districts uh, has about 80%, of your property tax bill goes to them and we're just one of the slivers of the pie at nine percent. So we are small as far as in our property tax levy uh, for the city portion. This is a slide I've showed for a couple of years but uh, it kind of paints a, a good picture to see in dollar amounts what that is. Last year um, we did uh, hold the rate, I'm going to explain what that is, and raise it just a little bit. You can see the impact on an average home. It raised it from 139 to 159 um, for that year that, uh, for the truth and taxation hearing. So if you can see that number that's in orange, it's 991, if you can find that, or pink, whatever number that, what color that is. Um, but uh, I can probably highlight it here with this. So if you look at that number, I'm, I'm going to come back to that number a couple times. So 991 is our current property tax rate for 2019. The county is right now with the state in the process of assessing every, everybody's home and business in, the, in Spanish Fork and going to come up with a new value. Um, the way the property tax laws are written, the city can only receive the same amount of dollars we got last year off of the homes and, uh, that, and businesses that are in existence from last year. We do get the new growth. If any new homes come, we get to have the new growth or new business buildings. We get to have the new um, property tax off of that. So what happens each year is if the property gets assessed and it's the increase in value, we can still only receive the same dollar amount. So in the calculation, it forces the rate to be declined or decreased um, to get that same dollar amount. So the, the multiplier goes up, the rate goes down to net the same net dollars that we got last year. And so each year, if you don't adjust up your property tax rate um, to hold the rate, then you have a rate that is declining and um, it will gradually make force your rates to go down lower and lower and lower. This is not, this is a, kind of a, a fault or a, a, a failure of the property tax system in that cities aren't uh, able to capture uh, inflation to, to property values and stuff like that as services increase, as uh, costs increase, police salaries go up, um, the property tax amount that goes towards that stays the same unless you raise that property tax uh, levy amount. This is a summary of all the property taxes for last year of what their rates were and you can see on this, dia this chart we have Spanish Fork Cities at the very bottom is the lowest and you can see that the next one above us is Highland 
And what's their number? A 12. So you see the 1254, and you can see ours is still 991. So we're substantially uh, like 27% lower than the next closest city. And as you look up the scale, you can see all the rest of the cities in Utah County, uh, many of them are, have been maintaining their, holding their rate, allowing them to capture that in inflation, uh, cost of living uh, for their cities, and many of them have projects that they've done that they've raised their rates also. We have also raised ours a little bit in the last couple of years. We've also, we've, we've maintained the rate to capture revenue, and we've also increased it slightly. But as you can see, that we are still the very bottom of the list that's there. An interesting number that you can look at is down at the very bottom of this slide. Oh, two numbers. Let's first go. This number here tells you the value of all assessed value of property in Spanish Fork. And I think that says 25 billion. I mean, it's a little bit far away from me. Is it 25? 2.5. 2. 2. 2. Sorry, it's a long ways away from here. Um, that's what the value is. So you take that, times it by your rate, and that's what your property tax that we get. So looking at houses in Payson and Springville, look how much more uh, the exact same house with the same value. If you lived in Payson, you'd be paying $45 more. If you lived in Springville, you'd be paying $124 more um, for that same exact house, depending upon which house, which city you live in. So I'm going to come back to this slide, but what I want to illustrate is Spanish Fork City has room in their property tax rate to hold the rate so it doesn't go any lower, and also an opportunity to raise the rate a little bit to capture some money for these two projects that we're going to talk about, which is the fire station, ambulance station, and the new library. Okay, the plan. So this is what we've, we've done this before a couple times. We've talked about holding the rate, so you know what that means when I say hold the rate, so it won't fall anymore, and also raise the rate a little bit, so we have projects we can th use the money for. This is an opportunity to capture that money. This is a, a list of the years of the past several years, and you can see there's been times that we've held the rate, and we went these number of years without holding the rate, and we let the, the rate gradually decline more and more. So in 18, we held the rate. In 19, we held the rate and raised the rate just a little bit. And so as far as the plan that we have talked in the past, it is planned or proposed that we would go into 2020's year, not only hold the rate, but also um, raise the rate slightly, okay? These are slides from last year's. Because the state hasn't given us numbers to know what our value is right now, so we don't know how far our rate will fall. I'm going to briefly go through these same slides from last year so you can paint the picture in your mind on what does it mean to raise the rate and to, to hold the rate and to raise the rate. So in eight, 2018, this was our rate that we taxed things by. The value of all the homes would have caused the rate to decline to 860, so a decline in the rate, and we still captured the same amount of dollars. Okay, for the fire station in 2019, which is the second year for the fire station, we needed $150,000 of new money that was building up that we can maintain and pay for the, the fire station and ambulance station. I'm gonna say six, station 62 from now on. Station 62. Um, so in order to do that, if we maintain the rate, meaning raising the rate from the 860 up to the 955, that would cause us to capture some revenue. We only needed 150,000 for the fire station. So what that did, it, in order to get the 150, it raised up um, part way up towards the holding the rate. So we we're able to fund all of the fire station needs, and then had a little bit more that was available to go towards the library until we met hold the rate. So to, hold, to get enough money for the library, the first year of the library, and again, that's the second year for the fire, the station 62, um, we tagged, um, I 
I'm looking at number 180, um, is what we needed to get um, for the library. In order to get 180, we needed to raise it not only up to the hold the rate, but also to raise the rate up to 991. And so you can see through this, the dialogue, we start out at 955, it would have dropped to six, uh, 860, but we raised it up to the hold the rate and then raised it up to 991. Still substantially less than other cities in our area. Okay, so that's the process that we did last year. Once we find out from the county what our assessed value is, then we're gonna know how far the, the rate might fall so we know how much we can capture from raising the rate, or, or I mean holding the rate. And then we'll be able to find out how much we need to raise the rate in order to capture the next increment we need for the, li for the library. So now I'm gonna zoom in on just this east, uh, this side of the, of the slide right here so you can see what I'm gonna talk about. Okay. First, let's do this. Um, so the plan was to hold for the fire station three years, and la in this next year, with the numbers we're estimating, um, Seth has, uh, and I have estimated what we think might happen with the, with the value. So these are estimates right here that we think might, the way it might play out when the numbers come in. That for this third year for the fire station, it would cause uh, that we'd need to raise the average home seven, 77 cents per month. Uh, which it's a very small number. Um, and then in order to capture for the library, for the, for the other part, for its second year it would be $1.74 to raise on each per month. So if you add those two together, that's the impact of the new money that would come. So I, don't, I wanna walk through what this is, how this will play out for the next, the next year. So this is last year's. For, for getting 180, it raised the average house, uh, average home, 95 cents and for the library and 81 cents for the uh, station 62. Um, for this year's proposed, we need $340,000 in order to meet up. <laughs> Wow. That's weird. We know all about what's happening now. <laughs> Thank you, Kent. <laughs> Wait a little. Spice up the budget presentation. <laughs> just seeing if you guys are awake. That's probably... Anyway, that's weird. It knows my voice, I guess. Um, so what we need is 340 for the second year of the library and we need 150 for the last year of the station 62. And in order to do that, it would raise by a dollar 74 and 77 cents. What that would do in the end, if you apply that rate, would raise ours to, and I'm squinting to see this, 1058. Yeah. So we'd go from that 955 to 991 to 1058. And so if you can remember what the lowest one that was still above us was 12 something that uh, was above us. Um, the plan is the next year for 2021 to finish out this cycle or the, or the plan would be that the fire station would then would be off. There would no longer be an increase for the fire station because over the past three years, we increased it enough to gather money to not only pay for it, but also to maintain enough money to maintain it and to fund, to run the new station. So it does have a revenue source for the new station. In order to get to the point we need to bond for the library and for the library's portion, uh, is the bond payment will be made up of some property tax and some utilities tax because part of the building will be the utility office. Um, so each utility will be paying a portion of um, the new building also. So we need, as a debt payment, almost a million dollars to pay for the library. 
So in order to come up with that money, we have 180, 340, and help me with that one, 460? 465. 465. So if we played it out for one more year um, and did our portion here to 10, 58, next year's increase would go to, help me, 1153, um, which is still less uh, than the other cities, not unless there's falls during that same time. But uh, so the reason why I bring up this much granule part is to this point right now. Um, there isn't the council's decision at the point of when do you want to do the, tr the, the truth and taxation <laughs> hearing and what amount do you want to do? So one of the options is to follow the plan that we currently have up on the screen is to take the portion for this year and then again we do the truth and taxation again next year for the, for the additional amount or an option would be is to bring this year's increase into this year and only do it one, this is the final year and it would gather enough money that we could have enough property tax to do that bond payment. Um, the, the plan is at the, right now is to, to bond sometime next February or March for the library, um, but we wouldn't have a bond payment until the, uh, the following year as soon as the library is completed, um, but it would give us an opportunity to have that revenue stream already established, and when we go to market, uh, when we explain that uh, our story to the bonding uh, companies that we have that revenue stream already locked up and approved and it would help us in our bond strategy of that. So, Seth, do you have any? I have lots I can say, but I can wait. Okay. Yeah. When, when did you say you're going to go for bond? Um, next March. Next March. Yeah, that would be the ideal time if we're going to construct in the spring of 21. Uh, at some point leading up to that, we'll have, we would have a guaranteed maximum price on the construction. We would know what that exact uh, bond amount should be, and we could go, uh, go get that bond at that time. Okay. I know that was a lot to <laughs> grind through. Thank you, and uh, sorry it was uh, gr granular at that point, but I, I think it was important for U.S. Council to see that option as far as do, if we hold the rate, um, this year, we would be holding it up um, to get 991, and then we'd need to increase that probably to a 12, is probably, or close to the, into the 11 something. So we'll know, we don't know the exact amount even for this year until the county tells us what our property values are. And so the timetable on the notice and, uh, to go, looking forward to the August 4th meeting is, um, or the process would be tonight is the public hearing. Um, what I'd like you to do at the end is to adopt this budget as the new tentative budget because there's been some changes. We want it to be the new tentative one going forward. Um, it won't be the final budget, but I want to I was, uh, suggest to adopt it as the tentative budget that, to replace the one you did in, uh, uh, on May 5th then we'll abide by this one. If you want to go forward to the truth and taxation hearing, then we give notice at the end of June to the county to say, Spanish Fork City wants to do a truth and taxation hearing. Please schedule on the 4th. Um, this is what we would propose for our new rate, and it could be 10.58, or it could be 12, or it could be you know, whatever number it might be. Um, and then they'll send a notice to all the property owners in uh, the middle of July, and the, your every annual your property tax notice will have our notice and announcement of when our public hearing is. You have that meeting in, on, August, on uh, August 4th, um, and the public has a chance to have a public hearing then to voice concern about that property tax increase, and then a vote of the council would enact that uh, certified rate or proposed rate. Okay, so that's all. Maybe, maybe let me inject here. Okay. Through some of the discussions that we've had uh, individually about the budget, we discussed 
this three-year plan, uh, I think there was some great discussion about uh, the, the pros and cons of going through, continuing forward, I guess I should say, with the project it, uh, in, in March and of 21. I can enumerate some of those here if you'd like, or uh, they were stated in the budget letter a month ago. But uh, one thing that was brought up in the discussions was the possibility or the consideration of instead of doing a two year or a three year uh, property tax uh, program, consider doing that third year this year um, and just raise the property tax one more time for uh, the library portion. And uh, we can go through all of those numbers, it act, the, the numbers are basically the same. We're, we're not trying to raise the, the property tax to a higher level just because we've got a target amount that we're trying to get to in order to make uh, a portion of the payment for the bond. Um, and so whether we, whether we raise the property tax to the full amount this year or next year, it adds up to um, about $2.30 difference between this year and next year. Um, which adds, which is about $28 a month on the average home. Because all of these funds are going into the library capital project fund, we, we're actually, any money that is, any additional revenue that is brought in with this, say if we, if we choose to raise the property tax rate a little bit more this year, any amount that is brought in is going into the library capital project fund which then gives us the ability to have more of a down payment uh, on the, the library project itself. So we're not, we're not raising the money and that's just additional money that we would be taking from the residents in that process. We would actually then be gathering, I think it adds up to about 500,000, a little bit more than $500,000. That would simply go toward the down payment more so and, and decrease the level of the bond. Um, it would save about $175, sorry, $175,000 over the life of the loan if you take, yeah, if we have $500,000 that we pay in down payment that we aren't paying interest on over the life of the loan, you'd save that interest amount. Um, that's maybe a positive or a negative, uh, you know, depending on if you want the $28 today or save $175,000 over the life of the loan. Um, so there's some, there's some plus and minus there. We'll have our numbers sometime in the next week, maybe by the time we meet again. It's, this is a pretty early second council meeting for us, so do you think we'll have them by June sure. 18th or June 16th? 16th? I think that's just sure. about as early as we can get, I think, in, in our cycle of how meetings work on a calendar. So we'll be pushing the county to get those numbers. Uh, we think we're pretty close. Um, we've allowed for growth and we've allowed for inflation and how that affects our property taxes. Uh, but uh, we can, we'll have some truer numbers next week. But I think some, some thought or some, some guidance from you maybe at this moment would be helpful. Is that something we should, we should be looking at, something that we should be pr putting together for discussion uh, next week in, as we go to maybe make the decision of, of whether or not we're simply approving the budget or we're going to go to that truth and taxation and, and what should that number be? Uh, I think that guidance for us would be helpful. I think the two factors for me that helped me somewhat make the suggestion to you when we met, Seth, was that as we, as we look at bond, rate, bond rates right now, they're the lowest in forever. They are, um, and we know that our plan is to go forward, so you know how I feel about it. Um, we, we've also seen some of our sales tax numbers, and they're not as low as, we, we just had sort of some unknowns the last few months, but as we're seeing those come in, we feel a little more comfortable with what, with what we're seeing. Those were a couple of the reasons that I felt comfortable with not prolonging the process and possibly capturing the opportunity to bond at a lower rate sooner. That's why I liked the idea of this year. Definitely. I think we can save the taxpayer money by doing it earlier. You know, might pay a little more now, but on the end of it, we can save them a big chunk 
At least that's how I understand it, is that right? Yeah, that's, that's how it would work. Um, you'd have, like I said, any amount that is associated with this property tax increase, we would budget just right into that capital project fund. So it's, uh, you know, the project is, is you know, whatever the, 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 dar the target dollar amount is, whatever the cost is, we're just gonna have a down payment that's that much bigger uh, which decreases our overall interest cost on the project. All right. So I, I feel we definitely need to move to a truth in taxation in August, you know, and then decide whether we want to do both or one. Yeah. So, agree. yeah, we will have, you know, at least that's my recommendation. Yeah, my direction just echoes what Brandon said about if we're committed and we've the residents have given their input on the library and design and things like that. We went down the road a whole long ways to just prolong it another year to just say, well, it's convenient. It just goes up a little bit. Well, let's just say this is how much it goes up to cost for the new library and to bond for it and get it going. I think it's good planning. Talked to a uh, friend that works in the construction field and he got a letter from one of the major home builders that uh, uh, basically asked them to revise all their pricing and they expected a 30% decrease if you wanted to continue doing work for that particular builder. And uh, I think there's also some opportunity right now maybe to, as we're bidding out a project of that size, to maybe capture some of that same savings as we, as we build a project of that magnitude. Yeah. So Seth, you just need direction to move forward to the truth in taxation, not necessarily whether we'll capture all the money in the second year or do you kind of want direction for the two-year or the three-year? So at, at some point, we'll need to notice to the public what, what the possibility is. Mm -hmm. uh, that truth and taxation hearing notice really should be kind of at the parameter, right? Right. On the high end. So by about the 22nd of June is when I need to give notice back to the county so they can prepare the notice that they send out in the mid-July of what we're proposing to do. So by like June 20th, June 22nd, somewhere in there, <clears throat> that's the deadline to pull, show our, play our card of what we want them to mm -hmm. advertise. And then you still have the public hearing and then still you can, you can make your decision in, in you, you want to notice here and if you, d if you only do one year, then you fall back to a different one. As long as you've, you've gone to the maximum, then you at least have that option there. So. Yeah, so you could, you could consider it even like a, a parameters resolution. Um, I don't think you, if you notice to this point, I don't think you can go beyond it after that truth and taxation hearing. So, so we do need to know, is there, what's the upper limit that you want to consider in that truth and taxation hearing come August? Um, and we can have both scenarios presented and we can walk through that uh, in next week's council meeting, but we will need that direction from you at that council meeting in, next, in two weeks because of the deadline with the county for that noticing. Um, and then, yeah, Brandon, back to your comment of, you know, what, what will we start to see in a decrease in pricing? If we got to 30%, that's a definitely a fantastic reason to take advantage of, rather than, uh, take advantage of uh, the building's climate. Uh, at, at the last five years, we've been taken advantage of. If you're building something, you've paid, you know, significant premiums as prices have simply just skyrocketed year after year. Anybody that's constructed anything knows that. Um, and, and so being, if we're, if we've decided that we're gonna build a building, and I think the public as they've watched this, you know, last year we had a discussion about should we not, should we go forward and start a construction process? And, and the decision was made a year ago that yes, we've been doing some design. I think we're really close to the end of what is called schematic design. I think schematic design, and next we move into the initials DD, but I can't remember what the first D is. Um, second D is design. Detail. Detail design, is that what it was? Thank you, Vaughn. Um, and uh, we're, we're continuing forward. We will be prepared uh, near the end of this year, right around December, January, with plans to go to bid and to receive those bids back. Uh, we've hired a contractor who uh, in two weeks, you'll have that formal paperwork to hire the contractor who will help us first with design, and then there's a pause in the contract that allows for us to decide whether or not we want to build. That, that's on next week's or next council's agenda. 
but if we decide we want to go forward, they will be ready to give us a guaranteed maximum price sometime in the late, uh, late fall, early winter, or, or winter of this year. That'll give us an idea of what that is. And we can move forward building a library and taking advantage of potentially the lowest interest rates that we could have ever seen. When we were talking about this a year ago, the interest rate we were using was three and a quarter percent, which is fantastic. Right now, we're hearing and talking about interest rates that are two and three quarters percent, a half a percent lower, which on our project size could save just simply in interest costs about a million dollars. That's a huge savings for the residents. If we've decided that we're going to build a library, which as we've discussed, that decision has been made. We need a library. If we can construct the building, and, and let's say the construction is $18 million to build the library and the administrative side that we've talked through uh, in previous meetings with the council, uh, if it's going to be $18 million, but because of savings, it can be then 17 or 16 or even $15 million, that's a huge savings for the residents. If, again, we've decided we're going to build it, then you couple all of those decisions together and six or eight months from now is the best time that we could do it. We'd be very, uh, very wise stewards of that resource with that decision to move forward. Um, and, and some people continue to ask, well, we don't need a library. We don't use the library. I don't use the library. Um, our numbers are significantly opposite of that statement. And maybe I think it's important to, to always reiterate that point. Uh, the numbers of individuals that use the library is staggering. It is, um, I, it, it competes with the recreation program, and Dale's probably going to throw something at me, but yeah, I think it competes with the recreation program in terms of the households that use the library. There are those that don't use it, and, and we certainly know that. We had, uh, not every resident uses it, but active library patrons, uh, active library households is well above 75% uh, in our community. That is a fantastic uh, you know, service that is being used by the residents at high proportion. Um, and uh, the growth is coming. The growth is, we're already beyond the capacity of the space, but, uh, and as we continue to grow, what we've put together in the library design is uh, capable of handling growth for, uh, for a, handful, oh, a number of years, which is very important. So that's a long answer to a question that wasn't asked. Um, <laughs> You're good at long answers. Wasn't asked. <laughs> He's really I good. All right. Go forward with the plan. We'll okay. So we'll yeah. keep walking that down the track as we get more information. Uh, we'll bring that back to you. And there's another public hearing then in August that the public still have another opportunity for them to voice also besides today. So since I sit down, then it's the public hearing for the budget, which they can still comment on this also. Okay. I lost my. Um, I put this slide back up just so you remind you how low our property taxes are, and the fact that the city councils in the past have kept it low. Um, the the two projects that we have been raising them for, I feel, are worthy projects uh, for the community, in that uh, for a. Station 62 for the east side of town, and also the library for our, the rest of our citizens. So again, the budget for this year is 123. It's made up of parts of the library, parts of the sewer plant, parts of the sewer collection, um, the All Abilities Park, um, what are the other ones that I mentioned. So again, it'll be in August when the Truth and Taxation hearing Take talks about so I'll it, wait for the RDA after this. So. Is yeah, please wait. Is all of the uh, part of the all abilities that was in this year's right? Correct. And some of it's going to be in next year's. Same with sixty two yep. station sixty two. Okay, the list of equipment that are on the back sheet is that equipment that is done with this rotation and we're changing yes. out? Those are all the ones that will be bought this in 2021. Okay. So it's been sorted by the purchase. The five-year plan or whatever we're doing there. Those that are on it would be on okay. there. Okay. Summer 12, summer 20. Just whatever. Yeah. The, the rotation. Okay. Thanks, Ken. That's all. All right. I'd entertain a motion to go into public hearing. So moved. Second. 
Got a motion by Councilman Argyle, a second by Councilman Gordon. All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone that'd like to uh, talk about the budget, you're welcome to come up from the public. Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to go out of public hearing. A motion to go out of public hearing. And a motion by Councilman Gordon. Second. Council, a uh, second by Council Member Beck. All in favor say aye. 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 Any other discussions or comments? If not, I would entertain a motion. I move we recommend, uh, or I move uh, that uh, we adopt the new. Uh, approve the extended budget. Yeah, approve, not adopt, approve the tentative budget as outlined by Ken. Got a motion by Council Mendenhall. Second. Second. Second by Councilman Scopes. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes. Okay. Public hearing to allow input regarding the insurance sale of not more than $90 million aggregate principal amount of sewer revenue bonds. That's as far as I'm, I'm going. I'm going to be shorter on this one, honestly. You promise? I promise. Okay. <laughs> so, um, a couple weeks ago, we did a parameters resolution for the sewer bond, and we set parameters uh, by uh, resolution of, of not to exceed amounts, not to exceed 90 million, uh, not to exceed a certain interest rate, not to exceed a certain term, and also authorize the publish a notice of a public hearing, which is tonight, for the public have an opportunity to to talk about issuing bonds and to give input to the council about issuing these bonds and so um, the bonds are to be used uh, and pledged through the revenue stream of our sewer our wastewater treatment plant our sewer plant and it's not to exceed 90 million and we spent a work session the council has uh, tonight um, from Chris uh, talking about what that project is and we're in coordination with Mapleton also um, they're one of our largest users uh, of our uh, sewer plant, and so as we build a new plant, uh, they're going to pay their portion of um, the plant, which would be theirs, and the city will pay our portion. Uh, the city will be issuing the bonds as, I guess, the parent of the, the bonds, and we will be making the bond payments, and we'll be assessing Mapleton to pay the city so we can pay the bond payment also. Um, with that, this is an opportunity for a public hearing to give comment of that, and then we'll continue that the process toward issuing of the bonds uh, probably later this fall is when um, that would probably going to be done. So, great. Can I just correct, Kent, that Mapleton's not the largest user, but just roughly 15 to 20 percent. I think that came out. 26. Single customer. Uh, as a customer, okay. Right. Okay, so, the way I heard it was that they were our largest user. I wanted to make sure to clear that. As a customer. As a customer. They're one of our largest users. They're our only customer. When they <laughs> compare, you know, Mapleton to the Gordon household, yeah, there's they no, they, yeah, they're just yeah, slightly more. Okay, than let's, let's there not There you go. go. All right, I'd entertain a motion to go into public hearing. Motion so to go into public Got a motion by Councilman Scobes. Second. Second by Councilman Gordon. All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone from the public that would like to get up and speak to this, you're welcome. Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to go out of public hearing. So moved. Second. Got a motion by Council Mendenhall, a second by Councilman Argyle. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, no action needed. Okay. Any questions, entertainment, comments? No entertainment. No entertainment you? down here. Okay. I was just wondering if anybody was listening. I would entertain a motion then. We don't need a motion. Oh, there is no motion. Never mind. I wouldn't entertain it at all. <laughs> okay, let's move on to new business. Swift Creek annexation acceptance for further study. Now we got the short winded guy that speak to us after Kent sat down. Yep. So there's an area, if you can kind of picture this, 
that is east of Spanish Fork Parkway, north of US Highway 6. I mean, kind of picture south of Maple Mountain High School where Spanish Fork Parkway crosses the highway there. Just to the east of that, over to 3400 East, which is the next road to the east that goes north and south that also intersects with US Highway 6. It's kind of interesting that that is sort of a void of city property. So Scott, if you could turn on the zoning map, that's maybe just the best way to, to really okay. illustrate what we're talking about. Yeah, thanks. This will kind of help as well. So the, the areas that are colored there, those are in Spanish Fork City. So coming from the, the east going west, this is here, everything south of US 6 is, but on the north side of US 6, again, we have kind of a hole, if you can maybe pan down just a little bit for us, Scott, up into this area here, with the idea that the railroad tracks over here will eventually be the boundary between Spanish Fork and Mapleton. This is still in Utah County. What's proposed tonight is the consideration of an annexation that would involve some land right down here and start to fill in that void. So specifically, we asked the council tonight to accept the proposed Swift Creek annexation just for further study that initiates the formal process of reviewing the annexation proposal with the idea that that would then be back on a council agenda at some point in the future, probably three or four months from now, after we've been through a protest period and we've taken it to the Planning Commission for a recommendation and some different things like that. Um, so again, nothing binding tonight other than the green light staff to take some formal procedures that are spelled out in the state code relative to starting that annexation process. I will just mention that with some other projects that are happening in the area, I think it's getting ripe. It's getting ready. The one thing that for a long time presented, excuse me, prevented really any properties on the east side of, I used to really know it as 2550 East, but Spanish Fork Parkway from developing, it's just a lack of infrastructure and that's, that's uh, been remedied to some extent up a little bit further north, just east of Maple Mountain High School. And that infrastructure is gonna be delivered in various ways, you know, further south and throughout the area that's now in the county. And I think we'll probably see some pressure to develop in there that we haven't ever seen before, so. Is the applicant property owner? No, it's a representative of a development company. I believe D.R. Horton is the, the company that would like to develop that. All right, any other questions? Comments for Dave? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion. I move to approve the Swift Creek annexation acceptance for further, further study. Second. Got a motion by Council Member Beck, a second by Councilman Scopes. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Resolution 20 17, approving the First Amendment and reinstated interlocal agreement with Utah Risk Management Agency. Mayor, this is uh, the first amended interlocal agreement with, that uh, has created and forms the association that we belong to for our risk management, IRMA. It's a name you all know. Um, there are several things about this agreement that uh, this uh, first amended interlocal agreement that are being uh, cleaned up, I think is the best way to describe it. It actually hasn't been addressed in this forum since the creation of IRMA in 1985. It was a good year, 1985. It was a while ago. Um, so there's a lot of cleanup, but frankly, almost all of them, uh, with the exception of one or two items, are things that IRMA as an association have been doing. They just haven't been doing them according to this interlocal agreement. And so as we made a major review of uh, our association documents found that there were some things in uh, out of compliance. 
So this has been reviewed by the IRMA board. It's been reviewed by each city's attorney and is now before every city uh, that is a member of IRMA for their approval as required by the first document. One thing that is in this document that uh, is new is it does give the board of IRMA the ability to make some changes to the interlocal agreement that are basically not of consequence. Uh, and there are little technical items that come up through the years and the board can, it, this gives them the ability to make those changes without having to go to all of the member cities, which as you can imagine, that's a long process, making sure that every city uh, puts this on their agenda, has it reviewed and, and is approved. So that, that's maybe the biggest single change in here, but uh, those items are defined as, as inconsequential. With that uh, explanation, certainly can answer any questions that you may have. I am the board chair uh, for Irma, so if I don't know the answers, we're in trouble. Wow. Uh, I will say, you, hopefully you noticed that Irma lost a letter. So COVID uh, stripped it, you know, 20% reduction. You are MA now instead of two Ms. Actually it had nothing to do with COVID. Right. Any questions for the chairman of Irma? What was the other M? Used to be Utah Risk Management Mutual Association. Uh, the state laws no longer allow the, the type of government entity that IRMA is. By their rules, by state law, it, is, it cannot be an association, it's an agency. So thankfully, agency starts with A. That would have been tragic. Um, and so with that change, the, the board discussed we aren't a mutual, you know, whatever the term mutual implies, um, and so through discussions decided that it, it's just be really simple. Utah Risk, yeah, and so Utah Risk Management Agency, um, and uh, so just a simple change. So does that mean Brandon can't wear his old shirts, Irma <laughs> shirts? He totally can. He will be, he'll just be part of the 20% club. Okay. They're collector's items now. Yeah. Uh, if he wants to, we can get him like a, we can get him a Sharpie and just like color in the second right. M or the yeah. first M, doesn't matter. It's, it's interchangeable. There it's you the go. Yeah. All right. If there is no other questions, I would entertain a motion. Motion to approve resolution 20-17, uh, approving a first amendment and restated interlocal agreement with the Utah Risk Management Agency. A second. motion by Councilman Scobes, a second by Councilman Mendenhall. This is a roll call vote. Councilman Mendenhall. Aye. Councilman Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Beck. Councilman Argyle. Aye. Councilman Scobes. Aye. That passes. All right. Ordinance 05 20, amending the Title 13. Mayor and Council, the ordinance you have before you tonight it does, does a few clarifications of housekeeping things. Um, basically clarifies the maintenance responsibilities for service laterals that are in the in the public right-of-way um, basically for metered um, services so like your pressurized water culinary water and things the city will maintain from the main to the to and including the meter but uh, after that the service lateral to the house or to the business is the owner's responsibility um, for non metered um, utilities that that is maintained by the city from the main to the property line for residential for commercial the or non-residential it's the entire distance from the the building to the main will be the property owner's responsibility so we're just clarifying that and then a little bit about trimming trees uh, the city is allowed to enter to trim trees but if they're on private property as long as we have an easement to do that and then finally, putting a requirement on owners to hire a, a, reg, a licensed contractor to do the trimming of, around power lines if they're on private property, just, to, just for safety. Any questions about the ordinance? Thank you, Vaughn. Uh, there is no other questions. I'd entertain a motion. Motion to approve Ordinance 505-20, amending Title 13. 
chapter four of the Spanish Fort Municipal Code related to service laterals and protection of city utilities. Got a motion by Councilman Argyle. Second. Second by Councilman Gordon. This also is a roll call vote. Uh, Councilman Gordon. Aye. Councilman Beck. Aye. Councilman Argyle. Aye. Councilman Scoves. Aye. Councilman Mendenhall. Aye. Okay, that passes. Motion to adjourn to redevelopment agency. Second. Got a motion by Councilman Gordon, second by Councilman Mendenhall. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion to approve the consent items. Second. Got a motion by Councilman Gordon, a second by Councilman Argyle. All in favor say aye. 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 All right, public hearing on the RDA 2021 budget. I hope you're a little quicker on this one than you did the last one. Just for you, Mayor, I will be. Okay, thank you. Okay, on the last page of the budget document, we have our uh, city RDA is a separate entity from the city, kind of. Um, the city council is the RDA board, and this is the budget. Um, just in review, uh, a couple of our RDA areas have been closing. Uh, it, meaning they've matured and we're not using them anymore <coughs> as far as gathering increment. So the windmills at the mouth of the canyon, they're, they're no longer collecting increment anymore. Um, the Kirby Lane one is not collecting any more increment and neither is the North Industrial. There is some money left in the North Industrial which is uh, why it still has a budget because there is a fund balance that we're still spending. The Kirby Lane one is exhausted to the end, and uh, <clears throat> the other two that are active, the Corona CRA is sales tax, not property tax, so it's still active because we have a payment to our developer uh, for that Lowe's and um, the King, Canyon Creek area. The uh, Sierra Bonita CDA is the Young Living area, uh, which has a small increment. Uh, anyway, if you look at the one, two, three, four, five, six column over, that's the total budget of all the areas that have active income um, and expenses, uh, which is a fund in our city fund accounting, but be, the state law requires us to report a budget separately, but when the audit comes, the audit is inside the cities. These financials fall back inside the city, but so it's just a budget that has to be prepared separately to send to the state auditor's office. Um, and that's what this is discussing about today. So if you flip that thing one spot, I should have, go ahead and. All right, so there's the, the column of each one of those are an RDA area, a CRA area, a CDA area, one of the RDA areas. So um, that's all I have, Mayor. Thank do you. These, do these go away? Can't like Kirby's done over with? Does it close and be yes. done and go away? Yep. Okay. In order to start another one in that same area, you'd have to go through all the hoops to start a new one. Okay. So those old ones, those first two, the first two columns, uh, North Industrial and the Kirby, um, they're kind of like my kids. They've, they've, been, been, they've been here as long, almost as long as I have. And it's kind of like when you hire a fire truck after you buy that brand new million dollar fire truck and then you see its life and you see it being sold. It's like, it's one of my kids. Same with some of these RDA areas. You babysit them, you, you nurse them through 20 years, and then you just, they retire and they no longer collect inc increments, so they dissolve and go away. Um, in the last couple of years, we've lost a couple of them. I mean, retired a couple of them. Explain how the property tax Good question. Um, so the way the RDA funds itself is there's a base value that's there, and then you establish that base value. And then development comes in and increases the value of that's on there. And so the d increment difference between what was there before the RDA was d created and what's there after the new buildings in there, the RDA itself gets to capture that as income to use for utilities, to use to uh, help a developer develop that area or to do something with the property. And the new rules um, of RDAs, CRAs, is that you have to go to all the taxing entities who has to give up that increment. They have to agree to it. And so when some of the newer ones are created, we go to the school district and say, would you please participate in this? It'll help our community. This is how the impact is. And then once that increment is used by the 
the RDA over its life, and once it's dissolved, then all that increment then falls back to all those taxing entities. So if there was $100,000 of increment, the school district in, uh, relatively would be giving up 80000 and giving it to the, to the RDA. When the RDA is done, now the school district gets back that 80000 per year that uh, otherwise wouldn't have been there. So the development wouldn't have come in unless they had some incentive. And so in the end, it helped grow the value, which then turns back to the school district, and they get to have that value back and the property tax income. Thank you. Any, uh, motion I, to go into public hearing. That's what I'd like to have. Second. Got a motion by Councilman Gordon, a second by Councilman Mendenhall. All in favor? Aye. Okay, we're in a public hearing. Anyone that'd like to talk about the RDA budget, you're welcome to come forward. Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to go out of public hearing. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilman Gordon, a second by Council Member Beck. All in favor say aye. Aye. All right, any questions, comments about the budget? If not, I'd entertain a motion. Same, same thing as Mike. The, approve the tentative. Kent? You're being asked a question. Oh, <laughs> the same thing we did with the other. Yes. Motion to approve the tentative FY 2021 RDA budget. Second. Got a motion by Councilman Gordon, a second by Councilman Argyle. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. I move to go back into city council meeting. Second. Got a motion by Councilman Mendenhall, a second by Councilman Argyle. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Number 11, discussion. Seth, would you like to do a discussion with us? We will do a discussion. That's what I like. Uh, Mayor, Council, tonight, uh, just as part of this discussion, I uh, want to give you an update on the Fiesta Days Rodeo and uh, share with you some thoughts and insights as well as a uh, recommendation from the Fiesta Days Rodeo Committee. And in addition to that, uh, some insight from the Diamond Fork Riding Club and a position that they they took last night. And Dale, why don't you come up here and join me at the microphone? I can hear, hear you. Do you think Kevin will make it? Yes. Do you think Kevin will make it back? There's a or microphone over there. Get over there. Just give him the one by you. There you go. Um, all right. So for the last uh, month, the Fiesta, Fiesta Days Rodeo Committee has been discussing uh, probably the number one question that many get asked in one or two nuanced ways, is the Fiesta Days Rodeo going to happen or is the Fiesta Day Celebration going to happen or both? Um, and uh, in the current circumstances with COVID, the challenge that we have is we have an ever-changing landscape. And uh, gratefully and thankfully that landscape is changing for the positive as things continue to open up. The unknown still associated with moving forward and having an event in these COVID times uh, are still a lot. Uh, what, what color will we be in July? What will the requirements and regulations, rules associated with whatever color we are in be in July? And those that have been following the issue maybe on a, a close level at the state, um, they know that the guidelines, the phased guidelines that we follow that they put out change about once a week, maybe two or three times a week. And, and so we, we get more information every day. As a committee, we have literally, well, I guess we haven't literally kicked the can, but we have pushed the decision as far as we can. And uh, we have a, a, a hard decision time tomorrow. So the timing is great. We have a council meeting tonight. And uh, we, we have reviewed all of the uh, information that we can get, the phase guidelines. We've had meetings with the PRCA. We've had meetings with um, our stock contractors. We've had conversations with every one of our contract personnel, I believe. Yes. 
Um, we've had conversations with the state of Utah, members of the COVID task force. We've had conversations with Utah County Health Department. We've bantered and debated and argued and pushed, and I think some have even cried around the issue, trying to figure out the best, what is the best thing to do. As we talk about the heritage and uh, the ideal that is our Fiesta Days Rodeo, and I am only talking about at this moment now the Fiesta Days Rodeo. The Fiesta Day celebration comes at a different time and from different people. And uh, so today, I, Dale and I are only talking about the Fiesta Days Rodeo. There are some significant risks going forward. And I think the most important thing we want to make sure that you understand is there are risks. Um, but before I go into those risks, I want to maybe to, uh, get rid of the suspense. The Fiesta Days Rodeo Committee's recommendation is that we move forward and have the Fiesta Days Rodeo celebration in 2020. Diamond Fork Riding Club, in a meeting just after our rodeo committee meeting last night, as our uh, partner in the rodeo and as uh, the major army and workforce of the rodeo, reviewed all of the things associated with that recommendation and voted in their meeting to support all of the recommendations associated with um, what we'll talk about and present for you tonight. So with that kind of bottom line up front, the recommendation is that we move forward. There are some risks that we need to make sure we understand. And Dale, I, you jump in here and make sure that I'm maybe spelling them out as best that, that you and I know how. The biggest risk is that people don't come. That's the biggest risk. And if people don't come to the rodeo, the rodeo will not make the money it needs to cover its own expenses. Now, as we've run the math and we've cut the budget a little bit, there are expenditures that we can take out. We can't take out everything. We still have to pay our contractor, and if we're going to have five nights, that contractor's fee is what it is. Uh, we still have to put money into the purse. We still have to pay our different clowns and, and different acts. So there are a lot of fixed costs, some variable costs that we can deal with, and Nick uh, is doing a great job and, and is cutting and will cut and will hold the line on all of those things. But if we don't have people that come to the rodeo, it won't pay for itself. That is the single biggest risk. Uh, as we've done our calculations, uh, it is right around... 75% capacity. That's what we need to get to in order to have the rodeo break even. There's a little bit of play there, and that's probably conservative. Uh, maybe it's 70, but let's, let's focus on about 75% capacity for the rodeo to, move, rodeo to move forward. We cannot have 75% capacity in this rodeo if we are required to have social distance. That means six feet between every non-family group. That's been the single most challenge that the committee has had to combat. In conversations with the state, they have given us now in two different conversations, two different sessions, if you will, a very clear guidance that we can do a rodeo with people sitting normal, so what you and I are used to seeing in the rodeo, in July, in yellow, with one major change. And that is everybody has to wear a mask. So that's the rule. That's the requirement. If we want to have a rodeo in 2020, and if the conditions are yellow, just as they are today, the state's comfortable with us having a mask. And would you say, Dale, they're kind of eager for us to have a rodeo? The best way to describe it as we've had these conversations is, in order for the state to continue moving forward, we need to do some of these things. We need to try some of these things, and we need to see how well we do and how well the public does and what we learn from that. And it's not going to be a scapegoat situation that you, Spanish Fork, did a poor job, especially if we do our best. But they want to learn, can we do ba basketball games? Can we do football games? Can we do all these different things in these COVID times? And if so, is this the right way? And they'll, they'll walk through you know, successes and failures with us. But that's the big requirement. People have to wear a mask. Now, I'm not watching the Facebook Live feed, but I imagine that there are some people on there. And maybe one of the first comments is, don't they know masks don't work? By now, we've all seen the memes that have bodily functions and how certain functions escape through parts of our clothing. I'm going to be really straightforward in how I'm going to answer that question in any circle I'm, I'm in. 
I don't care. I want to have a rodeo. If you want to have a rodeo, the only way in yellow that we can have a rodeo is with a mask. So if you want to have a rodeo, we have to be comfortable that we can do it wearing masks. The riding club, as we discussed last night, uh, their position was, we want a rodeo, and if a rodeo requires a mask, we'll wear, we'll wear masks too. And so you'll see all of the staff associated with the rodeo wearing a mask, and it will likely be some kind of a bandana, because cowboys wore bandanas in the 1800s, and in 2020, bandanas are cool again. Uh, we'll figure that out. Dale said he's going to have a six-shooter, too. Probably some spurs, some chaps. Uh, he's probably going to rob something. His last name is Robin. So, Good one. so that's, that's maybe my uh, biggest thought to walk through. Dale, share some of your thoughts and your concerns that you want to um, make sure they have. Is this, is this it on? Will, it will come okay. on shortly. Um, yeah, and one one of the things I think that uh, that you need to make sure you're aware of is um, we're kind of standing alone on an island here, and and so for better or for worse, we're going to be in the limelight. Um, I mean, you're going to have we, this is a, a nationally televised event, and uh, and as you may or may not know. Uh, all of the major rodeos around us on this date have canceled. And most all of the rodeos in Utah have canceled. And so uh, I, I like to liken this because of my occupation as to being a, an official. 50% of the people are going to hate that we're doing it, and 50% of the people are probably going to love us. So uh, we, we are going to have to be prepared to answer some questions to the naysayers that are saying, what are you doing? Are you guys crazy? Everybody else has canceled. So th there, there will be some negative repercussions. Um, we're prepared to answer those questions. We're also following very strictly the guidelines of the CDC that has been set up. So we're not doing this alone and, and recklessly. Uh, this is an educated uh, decision that has been made, as educated as you can get in these times, right? I mean, to me, the very worst case scenario is for us to move forward and say, yes, we're going, and then have something terrible happen and make us have to put on the brakes. And the only, th the only thing we can see happening there is if, for some crazy reason, we have to go back to red in the state of Utah, right? Um, but we're, we're, uh, we're, we're doing our due diligence to make sure that the county health, the state, everybody's behind this event. and. Uh, and so we just want to make sure that you're aware of the risks that, that, there are, that there are. We've got some sponsors that have fallen upon hard times. Some of them aren't going to be able to re-up this year. Um, and, and you'll have some people, some, will, some maybe that have bought box seats and bought tickets that may say, you know what, I, I just think I'm going to forego this year. Uh, and, I, and we accommodate them and, and give people refunds. And we'll keep their sponsor spots. We'll keep their box seats for next year. We'll give them an opportunity to re-up those next time. Um, so, but I think I think I think you've covered most of the concerns. Um, we've looked at worst-case scenarios. Um, I honestly don't believe. I, I think I honestly believe personally there's a really good chance we'll be in green then. So we're looking at this as a worst-case scenario. If we have to move forward in yellow, uh, we still have a path forward, and that's the most important part. There was some news just broke about an hour ago, maybe about two hours ago now. There was an article, some alert I got during our work session that I think it was an economic commission, COVID commission, recommended that there be some light green. And we were kind of joking in some of our meetings about, we feel like there's not just going to be a yellow to green, but there's probably some mellow yellow in there. Uh, and, and sure enough, that's at least what this group said. And, and as we talked with the state, that the guidance that they've said is if you've got a good path at yellow, then green is better. We just don't know exactly what that means. It's likely that some of these requirements may fall off. But I think it's absolutely critical that at this moment we all be comfortable that come July 24th, if we have to wear a mask, we have to wear a mask. And as long as we're comfortable with that, I think we've got a good path forward. Now, as far as selling the tickets, we, we've already sold 
um, a good portion of them. I just closed my computer. It's about dead. Um, I want to say, I'll, I'll get some numbers here, about 17,000 total seats. We've got to get to about 32. So we're about halfway there to breaking even. Now we've sold, instead of 32,000 total seats, last year we sold about 42,000. So you can see, we, in a normal year, it's, obviously it's not a challenge for us. And, and the definition of break even is, is kind of funny, but uh, for what we need in this circumstance, that, that's defined around 32,000 seats. So we have our work cut out for us. Those ticket sales were going great, and then COVID hit, and they've really plateaued. And so we'll have a lot of work to do to tell the world that we were good to go, and that we're good to go with masks. Uh, we, we're looking at acquiring bandanas that we could potentially give to everybody as they come in. If you have a mask, then you can, of course, wear your own. We'll look at doing some fun things, encouraging people to decorate their mask, and we'll have a contest, and I'm, I'm guessing that our clown wearing a mask will help us, you know, find people that have creative masks, and maybe we can give them awards, and, and you know, make it fun. Let's not make this some kind of drudgery, but it is what it is. And uh, we can cancel it or we can move forward, so let's just have some fun. And, and we'll have some pink masks for Tough Enough to Wear Pink Night and stuff like that. But uh, is, is the, we'll still have the, the fifth night, the bowl, all bowls? Yeah. We'll, st we'll still do yes. the all bowls? Yeah, yes. and that'll actually be the first night this It'll year. It'll be the first yeah. night yeah. on yeah. Monday. It's the first night. Yeah, so this year's rodeo is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. That's a tough road anyway. No Friday, Saturday, holiday, Monday kind of a setup. So it's a tough one. We've, we've sold out this setup uh, many times in the past you know, 15 years, but it is always kind of the hardest calendaring setup that we have. So I maybe just want to point out some of the things. On the current guidelines, this is 4.5.3. Now we were told today that there's a 4.6. Yeah, there's a new one. We just don't have it yet. <laughs> um, at 4.6, we'll say some of the things and give us some clarity that we're kind of bucking against. Uh, as we're talking about this rodeo. But this talks about how you must have six foot distance at all times. And it says that the capacity in our uh, reserve seating facility uh, is limited by our ability to separate. And, and that's where Dale kind of talks about. We, right now, it looks like we may be going against the guidance from the state. But we, this is not something that we're thumbing our nose at the state. We are walking in lockstep with the state Utah County Health Department, the PRCA. And so we, because of those things, we feel good. And we'll get some better clarification and have some joint meetings between the state, the health department, and us continuing you know, in the next couple of weeks so that everybody's clear, everybody's comfortable. But that's, that's where we stand. So what, what questions do we have from you? Talk, if you can, about the PRCA phone calls and the stock contractors. Because some people don't understand the challenges that they may be facing. Yeah, you want, want to take yeah, that? Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, so we've, we've communicated with the PRCA. Obviously, they are extremely anxious to have a rodeo or two. They've had a couple. They had one in Arizona where they had no fans and all the participants wore masks. So they're anxious to, to be able to, to get some of these venues up and rolling. Um, they're also willing to, uh, to help us a little bit financially because they realize that uh, all of our sponsors aren't going to be able to come forward, that maybe we're going to have a limited number of fans. Um, somebody on our committee guaranteed a sellout. So uh, this is, I, I don't personally think we're going to have a, tr we're going to have trouble getting our fans here. Uh, whether it's a, whether it's a sold out crowd or not, <clears throat> I don't know, but I don't think we're going to have any trouble getting our fans here. Uh, you'll have some that choose to stay home, and that's great. Um, so the PRCA is, is anxious to have this going. They've, they've offered some money to help us uh, subsidize some of the things that we will lose. Um, and what was your other question? Stock the stock contractors? Yeah, yeah we, you know, the stock contractor's in a real hard situation here, and they are the stock contractor of the year three times running Some, for I don't know it seems like every year they are the stock con they are the best in the country and and that's kind of what's driving this um, to have us have to make a decision this early is because there's a lot of preparation that goes into this um, and he has to buy calves 
I mean, tens of thousands of dollars worth of calves just, to, just for our rodeo. And they normally prepare this and go out on the circuit and they're gone all summer long, right? Well, we're the only rodeo standing right now. He's helping with one in Houston right now, but uh, for, for them to come clear out here just for this rodeo is a big expense for them. But there's a lot of preparation they have to go into to get stock trained. They have to train them. <laughs> Believe it or not, they do yeah. get trained. Sit. Come. <laughs> they train those calves Stay. to run out just perfectly so they can throw a rope <laughs> around their head. It does take some time. And, uh, and so he's, he's been gracious enough, we've been in constant conversation with him, to give us this much time. Uh, he, wanted, he wanted a little more leeway, but, or, or headway, but... Uh, we stretched him out a week. We got another week out of him, and he said, I, I really need to know this is kind of my dead end time. I've got to buy calves. I've got to. Last year, he brought hor bucking horses out of Canada because he wants to make sure Spanish Fork has the best around. And so, uh, so there's a lot of preparation that he has to go through and to, to collect enough stock. Um, also, the PRCA has some, they have some deadlines for their cowboys in order to register for certain events. Um, and to pay their card, their dues, their fees. So those are the things that we've been up against. Uh, yes, we'd like to wait a little bit longer because it's still 45 days out, um, but circumstances aren't going to allow us to do that. And we think it's only fair uh, to the stock contractors and all of the contract personnel who now are no longer coming on a circuit coming from Cody, Wyoming. They're flying out here from wherever they're from to do our rodeo. So they've got some arrangements to make in terms of hotels and flights and different things. So they're investing some money as well. Um, and so we're trying to give them as much, head, as much lead time as we can. To sum it up, they are eager for a rodeo. And, and they all recognize there is risk for each of them, just like we're talking about here. But balancing that out, they're very eager for the opportunity to do their sport, to do their craft. And so it's something they're, they're really, really excited about, the possibility. And uh, this, this will be a great opportunity for us. Uh, it, it will not, it cannot be the same. And, and if it was just any other rodeo any other year, you know, the, the collaboration between the committee and the riding club and the city, that's just, you know, that's easy, right? It just works. All of that's going to happen, but we're going to have to add in this layer of COVID that will require a little bit of difference. So to the patrons and fans that come, we ask them to... The, we need them to be patient. We need them to be compliant. Uh, and there's gonna be some people who say, I don't wanna do it. I'm not wearing a mask and I totally support them. Just stay home. It's not a time to you know, be political and stage or whatever. Just, you know what, stay home. And you may have some even if we go green that will still wear a mask. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Need to be okay with that. Totally, yeah. this, is, this, yeah. is, this is not, the time or place, you know, any of this to say, why are you wearing a mask? Or, hey, dummy, why are you wearing a mask? This is a time to just, everybody's dealing with this the same way. So one of the things I have to tell you, one of the things that's most important why we can do this is because we have registered seating. That is the single number one factor why we can do this. Because Seth buys five seats in this section. And if Dale is sitting in section A, and three days later has COVID, test positive, the health department traces back in time a little bit. And if Dale says, well, I was at the rodeo three days ago, they can come, where were you sitting? I was sitting in section A, and we can kind of identify the 20 seats around there. And we don't know exactly that Mike was sitting here because he bought five seats, but we know that Mike bought those five seats. So we can reach out to Mike, and the health department can reach out, right? And they can just put a net around the problem area. And that's the single biggest reason why this rodeo can happen. If we were a general admission rodeo, it wouldn't happen. So I started out by saying, and maybe some people are joining us watching this, I started out by saying, this is really just only about the rodeo. This is not about the Fiesta Day celebration. One of the biggest hurdles right now to the Fiesta Day celebration is we can't track, we can't trace who was there. So in a parade that has 10, 20, 30,000 people, you can't trace, well, I went to the parade, where were you? It was about in this area, who else was there? No idea. We can't really trace in a movie in the park. 
You know, we could funnel everybody in, we could make them reserve, but that, that's gonna be a very difficult thing to do. So I defer to Councilwoman Beck over there as she sits in those Fiesta Days meetings that they're doing exactly what the Rodeo Committee has done in pushing it as far, th that decision, as far down the road as they can, not because they're derelict in what they're doing, but because they desperately want to have it and they, want, they don't want to cancel prematurely and they don't want to make a premature decision otherwise. So they're doing exactly what the Rodeo Committee's done. So with that, the recommendation is that we move forward and, and the riding club supports that and the recommendation, of course, that we, we require masks and provide masks, bandanas of some kind, to those that come. This is budgeted. It's budgeted in both of the budgets, so it's not technically something that you need to approve, but it is something that we want to make sure that we see uh, you know, your support, because if you don't support it, then we don't do it either. So just that's kind of where we're at. Well, because we this give a yeehaw. That's what I was going to say. We should have brought our cowboy hats to throw in the air <laughs> yeah. and scream yeehaw. As Seth stated in the beginning, that it's a bit of a gamble, right? There's a risk here. And I think that's why we certainly would like your blessing, because you guys hold the purse strings to the city. And if, if there is a chance for us to lose a substantial amount of money, we want to make sure you're on board with taking that risk. Um, and so, yeah, technically we don't need any motion. We just need, yeah, a yeehaw or something, right, yeehaw. Brandon? Yeehaw. <laughs> Let's have a rodeo. <laughs> so we got a yeehaw from everyone? We have a, anyone that doesn't have a yeehaw? How about a giddy up? Giddy up? I think you uh, got the blessings of the council and the mayor because you know we, I've been on the fence for a long position. time. We've never known your position. You've been really quiet through <laughs> <laughs> He's the guy that guaranteed we'd be green by, I think it was today. Hey, Thanks, it's uh, getting there. Thanks. Silverado. Yeah, we're excited. Thank you. Well, and we'll have, we'll have more announcements to come in the future for Fiesta Days. Yeah. Uh, we have a little bit more leeway with a lot of those events. Uh, some of them, uh, again, uh, are restricted based on what Seth has mentioned, but uh, we have a little bit more uh, lead time. Now, you, you need to know that the committee and the staff are all planning, and we've been constantly planning, and then changing plans, and changing plans again. And they're doing an outstanding job, uh, you know, particularly all those volunteers and, and my staff uh, continuing to roll with this, right, and, right, and just hang on as long as we can hang on. And, and I see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, we're gonna have a Fiesta Days. It may look and feel a little bit different, but things are looking better and better about being able to have you know, the majority of the events that we're used to here. So uh, we'll look forward to some future announcements uh, regarding the rest of the celebration. Can I piggyback on that real fast? Um, they just had to change the date of the car show. They're gonna be updating the website and it'll be on July 11th. And so if you know anyone that has a cool car, get the word out, spread the word. We need people to start signing up. Again, it'll be Saturday, July 11th down at the sports park. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Mayor, I know it's obvious to all of us because we, we're in it all the time, but the people that watch these council meetings a lot are a lot of people that, uh, that uh, maybe are at, at that at-risk population and, uh, and might still be at some level of risk. And so... Again, what a cool thing that we have in our own network that not just the car show, but the rodeo and everything else that uh, if somebody's uncomfortable about coming out, they'll still get to be able to participate at NPS Days. Right. Yeah, and we've got these awesome SFCN people here that yeah. you're going you're gonna to be able to enjoy that and you do not have to be worried about coming out and risking uh, your health, your life. Uh, and we encourage those that are high risk that have, uh, to stay home because you can still enjoy the festivities with, with everyone else, which is really awesome. It's a, it's a neat, neat added benefit that we have by living in Spanish Fork. Well, I'll just uh, you know, reiterate, uh, this has been a long haul and we've really put a lot of time and effort in this and uh, making it happen. Just because we say we want it to happen doesn't mean it's going to happen. So, but now it's going to happen, and so it's it's a great thing. So, 
For those who like rodeos, get out there and get your tickets bought, because we are having a rodeo. And uh, if you know, all it takes is wearing a mask, so be it. And so get the word out to everybody. Uh, you know, Spanish Fork always leads out, and we're going to lead out again. And, uh, you know, so it'll be uh, exciting times and uh, a different time. You don't want to miss it. So uh, let's get there. I move we go into closed session for reasonably imminent litigation and land transaction. Second. Got a, got a motion by Councilman Gordon, a second by Councilman Mendenhall. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you everyone that uh, was here and who uh, was watching in TV land. We appreciate your support.